All right, welcome back to the Beyond the Buckets. Happy to have Mignon Moore. Welcome back to the program. We tried to do this uh, about a week ago, but the uh, electronic world wasn't allowing us to do it. So technical difficulties. Our new new way of living out here. <laughs> it's strong today. But uh, start off with uh, three fun facts that people might not know about you. Uh, three fun facts. Um, I really enjoy painting, actually. I like art. Um, I like fashion. That's kind of, I mean, I have a clothing line coming out, so that's kind of a fun fact. Yeah. Um, I am young for like my grade. That's kind of a fun fact. I kind of started school early. That's why I graduated at 21, um, my master's and my bachelor's. So kind of young for my area or uh, my grade. And then another fun fact, a lot of injuries. I've had like eight surgeries, or seven or eight surgeries. So Wow. Yeah. Well, tell me about the art piece. Um, you know, how long have you been practicing art? Um, well, I don't do it a lot. Um, I, I have like just clear canvases and I have paints here in my house. Sometimes I just go outside and just paint whatever, you know, comes to mind. Um, I actually have this painting on my wall. It just says Mignon and it has my name in splatters. Maybe I can send a picture that you can like insert or, insert it or something. But yeah, I just whatever comes to mind, just freehand it. Um, I've done just a couple of pieces, not like mosaics and like, I don't know, <laughs> Mona Lisa's, but like just pure art, whatever comes to my mind. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I'm terrible. My penmanship is horrible as artistic nature, but I always respect yeah. it. I like to do it. So I guess that leads yeah. into your three minute backstory. You talked a little bit about some of your injuries, but, you know, kind of give me the origin story of you in a, in a three to four minute piece. Um, well, I grew up in the Bay Area, originally from, born in Sacramento, California, moved to the Bay with my family when I was younger, um, always been in sports, my family, my parents have always had, my sister and I organized sports, softball, soccer, basketball, all of them. Um, I naturally gravitated towards soccer and basketball as my two main sports, um, but as I was getting, going into high school, it's kind of like the same season, the two, um, so I had to choose which avenue I wanted to go in, um, and I ultimately choose, chose basketball. Um, and I, as I was going into high school, I ended up going to Slesian High School with my sister Mariah. She was already there. And I tore my ACL the summer going into my freshman year. And then I rehabbed, didn't really rehab that great. Um, I then tore my second one, my second game back, my full, my first full game back, I tore my second ACL. So had those two setbacks right at, right going into high school, um, but kept at it. And I ultimately be, was able to come back to playing fully, got myself or myself a full ride scholarship to USC. I played on Cal Stars AAU. Um, we won Nike Nationals in 2015. So I was a part of that group. And went to USC, had the three years there, three strong years. I graduated early with my bachelor's degree in communications. Um, then I was able to transfer and not have the sit out rule apply to me. So then I chose the University of Oregon where I went there for my last year and got my master's in advertising and brand responsibility. Um, graduated there. Our season got cut short as a lot of people's seasons did get cut short. Um, but yeah, now I'm here. So a lot, a lot of um, memories and a lot going on in my college journey, but that kind of sums up how I got to where I am now. For sure. And it, it started with uh, a lot of heartbreak, you know, your eighth grade yes. and your freshman year, you got injured. And so were you, were you on the JV team at Salesian or were, were you on varsity? <laughs> like how, how was that whole process those first early couple years? Yeah, because I didn't really try out in high school. I know they have tryouts. Um, I kind of missed that period just because I was injured and coming back from injury. Um, coach uh, Stephen Pozzola, he was our head coach. He kind of was just already familiar with my family just because my sister and just seeing me play before I got injured. So uh, I kind of just went right on the team when I got off my injury. I never played um, on the JV team. Um, but yeah, these kind of just flow together once I was able and I got cleared to play, I kind of just transitioned on the varsity team. So you missed your first two years of playing high school basketball and then you played your last two? Um, I wouldn't say I missed it fully. I think I missed, I missed the beginning. So I got injured, uh, the summer of my going in my freshman year. So I had to sit out the whole, you know, training season practice, most of the season and then my first game back full game back was actually the state championship game um, in sleep train arena in Sacramento and I tore my other ACL in uh, going into halftime in that state championship game so I didn't miss my whole freshman year but I missed a part of it then I missed part of my sophomore year and then yeah I played some of my sophomore year 
Unbelievable. Yeah. Good yeah, high school player. You ended up being a really good high school player and uh, saw you saw you drop 40 team that I have to play quite often here in our league. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me about like what that workload was like for you to try to get back to try to really excel because your sister at that time uh, was at Louisville and you know you you had this barometer of where you wanted to go. But what was the work like to yeah. get to that point to, to get an offer from USC? Yeah, it, it just happened. If we're being honest, like injury, injury. And then it's like, okay, I finally, you know, got two new knees. Um, I'm blessed to have had them happen at an early age and I was still developing. Um, a lot of people have it later in their careers and it is hard to recover and come back. Um, I had it when I was what, 12 and 13 or 13 and 14. So I was really, really young still. Um, I didn't really realize how uh, major my surgeries were at the time, we're being honest. Now that I look back, I'm like, wow, I had two major surgeries at a really young age, but I just put my, you know, looked at my sister as an example. Um, I had someone like my sister to look at and be like, wow, like I want to get to that level. Like I want to experience what she's experienced. She was a McDonald's All-American, you know, USA gold medalist. So I'm like, this is my, this is my idol. Like I want to be like her. So like whatever I have to do to get there. Um, so this hard work, honestly, and determination, working with my dad, training, um, Coach Ron from Laney College, he was helping me with my therapy. I did the pool workouts with him, just work on my agility and just hours, hours, hours outside of playing the game on the court that actually helped me and just made my body strong to be able to do what I wanted to um, do. For sure. What was, uh, what was with your older sister like? You know, what were those one-on-ones in the backyard looking like and, and who were of the two? Yeah, a lot of a lot of work in the backyard. We had a basketball hoop um, growing up in our backyard. My dad would always have us working out, working on our free throws all the time. Um, free throws are the biggest thing that I remember growing up. He made us shoot, shoot, shoot until, you know, we got the correct score out of, you know, 10 that we needed to get. So, yeah, growing up with Mariah, it was crazy. She's always been really, really bigger than me. Um, I didn't start growing. Um, I was always pretty small and skinny. So she she bullied me, honestly, when I was younger. But it helped me um, be, be a strong player and, like, helped me become what I was as a player um so it was it was rough when I was younger because she was always bigger like I said um but it helped because it was always like competing versus a division one player because she was that and she you know she did that so yeah it was rough she probably took all the one-on-ones though I, I'm faster than her but she for sure had the, the body and the shot <laughs> for sure um I'm sure a couple of them ended in fights and whatnot. So that always happens with siblings. Yeah, a couple of them. I try to, I try to put up a good fight as I could, um, as much as I could. But yeah. Well, tell, tell me about uh, going to USC. You played Phonic, uh, a women's basketball player, and Cynthia Cooper. Yes. Tell me mm-hmm. what that was like when, you know, one of the best point guards of all time comes to you and says, hey, I want you to come play for me. Yeah. It was like a dream, to be honest. Um, Going into my junior year when I played the Cal Stars, I didn't have like a lot of looks from, you know, top, top schools, like the schools that I attended. I had some local um, division one schools, which is also a great opportunity. Um, but I actually went with my sister on her unofficial to USC when she was getting recruited. And I remember being there with her, like just wide eyes, like, wow, like how awesome is this? Like USC, love and basketball. Yeah, you have all these um, ties to school. <laughs> Um, so I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then I had that summer with um, Cal Stars and I got the USC offer very, very late in my commitment process. Um, and I was just like, no question. I don't, I don't even have to ask any more questions. Like I've already been on the campus. Uh, Cynthia Cooper, her resume speaks for herself. Um, being around the team, I got to be around some USC um, players. I was just like, this feels like home to me. And I've always loved LA. So it, it was just awesome, honestly. It just happened so fast. Like the offer, I, I um, committed when on my unofficial visit or my official visit. And things just started happening fast. And Cynthia, she's great. I still communicate with her to this day. Um, awesome coach, awesome person. So yeah, it was, it was a great experience. And I get to say I was, I was coached by one of the, the greatest legends in women's basketball. What did you learn from her, you know, uh, on the court as well as off the court? Just fierce, being fierce. She told me, I mean, we're very similar in the fact that we're really right-hand dominant. And Cynthia Cooper was very right-hand dominant. And so she told me, like, obviously I need to work on my left hand being versatile. But she's like, girl, I went through college. I went through the league, you know, destroying girls with just my right hand. So that's the biggest thing. We really had that right-hand connection as point guards and just being fierce, being gritty, getting into people, having that, you know, that sass about, about us on the court. And she was just 
a dog. So yeah, just, I learned a lot about her just on off the court. Nice. Um, what, uh, what is some advice she like gave you to, to kind of help you, um, either on or off the court? outside of just I mean being she fierce. Just let me be my own player yeah she just let me be my, be my own player um my freshman year there was a lot of guards that were actually injured so that's how I got my opportunity to get on the court um, a lot of upperclassmen had injuries and had a lot of stuff going on so she trusted me and she was just like go out there and do what you do you know she didn't really give me like she wasn't super hard and strict on what you can and can't do she just let her players be her players um, and that's kind of really what shaped me my freshman year shaped me as a player I was throughout my college career because I had that flexibility I had that confidence like hey when I just go out there and do my thing and I play my game I have success and she allowed me to do that um, as a coach. So I really appreciate her because, you know, she helped me, her and her coaching staff helped me throughout my, the rest of my college career. For sure. Uh, and going to Oregon, now you get to get in a different experience with coach Kelly Graves yes. and tell me about his impact mm -hmm. with you because, you know, a lot of the people that I've talked to that have played at Oregon, uh, you know, for him, they speak volumes about who, the person that he is the man that he is not off the court and just combining you know the basketball with the entire and that's one of the major major reasons why Oregon has had so much success and he's had success Zaga and and before that so tell me about your experience with coach Kelly Graves I mean KG like his, his resume speaks for itself and what he's doing at Oregon it works um he creates this family culture of these girls. The first thing that we did when I got on campus, first couple of months that I was there, we did a team retreat. It was all about family, it was about unity. Um, and he really instilled that as the players. And he has goals for us and he sets those goals right when we got there. And that's how it continued throughout the whole season. Um, but KG was awesome. I, it was his I was his first grad transfer. So I was his first other ever player that came in their last year to play and try to fit into a system. So for me as a player, it, I had to learn a lot because I was so used to a system of being so, you know, free and everything kind of running through me as a player that I actually had to sit down and learn a system and learn what works for them because I was playing on a starting five that four of the five returning girls already was in the system. I was the only girl that wasn't in the system to prior prior years. So um, it, it was a learning experience for sure for me, but the coaching staff was awesome. Um, KG was awesome. Mark and Chavi and Jody and the all rest of the coaches that were there really wel welcomed me like I was there for the last four years of my life. So yeah, it was a family environment. I still talk to KG to this day. He's an awesome person, has an awesome family, him, Mary, his children. Um, they're all awesome. So yeah, I'm, I'm super glad I made that, that change and that transfer because because now I have an extended family beyond what I would have had. That's great to hear. Um, you know, I just love, I got goosebumps because the family environment as a coach, you want to, you want your players to say that about you at the end of the day, like important because ball is one thing, but the relationships that you have with, with the players on and off the court is really shaping them in some way. He shaped who you are in a small way because you were going to be great no matter what. But just bringing that together to make it such a such a, a, a profound thing, I just think is a, 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 an amazing thing. And you guys were on your way to a national championship. I mean, you guys were number one in the country and, um, you know, publications and number one seed to the tournament. And then it gets shut down because of COVID. So what was that like? like for you guys you guys for sure were about to win like there is no doubt yeah it, it still hurts whenever someone brings it up I'm just like I can't believe that actually happened it, it all just happened like a movie for being honest it's like I've never been to the tournament I still haven't been to the tournament ever in my life and I never will be um and I made that transfer to Oregon because they had a championship mindset like I did and I knew that they had some missing pieces and I could have been that missing piece to that puzzle um so having this, these hopes, you know, beating Team USA, having the season that we had, Pac-12 regular season and Pac-12 tournament champions, and you're on this high, and then a pandemic happens and kind of just rips it away from you, it, it, it hurt. And I never experienced a watch party. I never experienced going to a tournament, being a part of that environment, which I really missed out on. Um, but I still got so much out of that season that I would not have. I mean, I played on the same court as Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird and all these other legends um, and we beat them. Sorry, you can USA. You did it. So it's like, that was our, that, I mean, I'm like, that's our championship. Like I know our team would have won the whole thing. Um, cause I experienced it and I was on the team. I'm kind of biased cause I was a player on their team. But if you watch film, you watch our, our 
unity and you watched our last game of the season, there was nobody that was going to stop us. Um, so, yeah, it's a bitter feeling, but all you can do is continue to move forward. Can't really take back and change time. So, No doubt. We should probably set that up. It's over. We get uh, UConn, Notre Dame, Oregon. Uh, everybody, everybody's been talking about that. Like, we get this South Carolina versus Oregon game um, on the side, but it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, I was able to coach you in the all-star game. Uh, what was that? Five years ago. And uh, I just remember the best thing that I ever did was just say, give her the ball and let her, let her go. <laughs> um, but you've always had the ball in your hands for so many years, you yeah. know, through high school, as well as college, you were the lead guard. And then you have to go play with Sabrina. Obviously you played with Sabrina with the Cal stars, but now yeah. you come in into a situation where she's got three full years as the, as the, you know, HB in charge. Right. And uh, you had to come into mm -hmm. that new system. What was that like for you? And how were you able to step into a system where you'd be the ball dominant guard anymore? Right. Um, I mean, I knew that going into Oregon, I wasn't going to be the primary score, the primary, you know, person, but that's what I was fine with. If I wanted that, I would have stayed at USC because um, I was that primary person. Um, I wanted something more than myself. I wanted to be a part of a team, a part of a championship mindset team. And Sab is the go-to player. Um, and you know that just being on her team, she's the person that you want the ball in their hand. She's going to make everybody else better. That's just, and you can learn so much from that. I learned so much from her throughout playing with her in high school and in college. Like she's an amazing player. She deserves everything that she has and that's coming for her. Um, but other key players too, you know, like Satu Sabali, she is insane. Like, I don't think people understand, like people can watch her from the outside, but playing with her, she's literally a unicorn because she, there's nothing like her. There's no one like her, like ever. Um, so Satu Ruthie is a dominant pig. Aaron is a crazy shooter, you know, Taylor, Jazz, all these players that we had in our team, they all had key roles to our success. Um, and I knew going into Oregon that they needed help with their defense. They needed help with, you know, just someone that can conduct everything. And I didn't have these crazy points like I had at USC or in high school, but that's not what I went there for. I went there to impact the team, help them, you know, with their defense and play a key role. And the coaches told me what my key role was. They allowed me to have some flexibility and still be my same person, but in player, but being a defender and in conducting the team, like I said, was my biggest role. And I feel like I did that. Um, I'm really proud of myself because um, I had the lowest amount of turn turn turnovers I ever had in my years. I think I had the same number of turn turn turnovers that I had um, games played. So I, you know, I controlled the ball and when I needed to, I stepped up and I was able to lean on my teammates. I wasn't able to do that really at USC, like lean on my teammates to take over because people have bad games and people, um, yeah, like I said, have bad games. So there was never a time that I worried that someone else wasn't going to step up because we had those players one through 13, one through 12 on our team. So yeah, it was awesome. Sab, Sab, my rest of my teammates, everybody at Oregon, so awesome. Um, but being able to just learn from them on and off the court was something that I'll be able to take away. From that, uh, you have so much maturity at a young age to be self-aware in the fact that it's more about we rather than me, or in this case, you, uh, you know, right. I just, I just think that's so refreshing. And a lot of young people can, can even old people really can take that advice and fit into the role, but thrive in the role. Like your important is Sabrina's and everybody else's, but without you playing that specific role, the team wouldn't be able to blossom. So I think that's great. Um, Thank you. Talk about your education. You've got a master's degree at 21 years old and, you know, just ex yes. extremely motivated to do all of those things. You know, tell me about why it was important for you to, to finish that education so quickly while a lot of people don't really I want to do. And it seems like you've identified what you want to do at an early age. And I think that's going to put you term. Um, yes, I, my mom always, um, instilled education in us. She was like, if you don't get good grades, if you don't take care of what you need to in the classroom, you can't do what you want on the court. So that was all always something that pushed my sister and I, um, super blessed to have the opportunity to get full rides, to get bachelor's and master's degrees. Like I don't have any debt for my education. And that's something that is so awesome. And I'm so grateful for, um, education and what you learn is something that takes you beyond playing in sports. So the fact that I got a master's and bachelor's degree through playing basketball is just awesome, to be honest. And um, it was hard work, you know, being able to fit that all in four years. But 
like I said, Oregon was the perfect fit because they had a one-year program. I can go there, get my master's degree. I can be on a championship team. Um, and then also at USC, having a USC degree is not bad. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a crazy experience. And I'm, I'm super blessed to be able to have my education to take with me for the rest of my life. I love it. And this is Beyond the Bucket. So tell us about your new clothing line, top two, not two, which means you're obviously number one. Um, So stepping into the entrepreneurial game, how has that been? uh, And, you know, starting this process and what was it like for you? Because not a lot of 21 year olds are, are doing this right now. Yeah, I, I've had this idea for a couple years now. I actually had this idea when I was at USC, um, but with the NCA rules and all that type of guidelines that they had, I was just like, let me just focus on my basketball stuff and keep this idea in mind. Um, that's not a guarantee though, because anyone could have taken my name, anybody could have taken my idea at any time. So it was a risk that I didn't start it when I had the idea. Um, so I'm telling everyone out there, if you have an idea, go get that trademark so you have the rights to it for the rest of your life. Um, but yeah, it was an idea that I had at USC and I'm just like, top two, not to like, that's just, you know, it speaks to what I'm about, you know, like if you're not, if you're top two, but you're not two, you're number one. So it's like always striving to be that number one, whatever that is in your eyes. Um, so it really just spoke to me my story. I've always been into just like oversized hoodies and like sweatpants and leggings and just like simple sets, but also have like my brand on it. So I'm like, I'm tired of buying other brands. Let me just create my own stuff. Um, so after college and during this quarantine, it really forced us to be in the house. And I'm like, all right, let me actually use this time now that I've you know, saved up and I've gotten my stuff in line. Like, let me actually focus on doing what I have to do to set this up for me for the future. So um, I, I, I opted out of, of playing and going over overseas just because that was not what was going to fit in my lifestyle at the time. I didn't want to go um, play thousands of miles away and um, do that. So I was like, let me try to figure out if I can get my feet set right now um, in the States. Um, and then let everything else figure itself out after that. But I've always wanted to be my own business owner. Um, I have this thing of, I mean, it's cool to work for other people and get yourself grounded, but I don't really want to work for anybody else. I'd rather work for myself um, and have my own schedule. Basketball is a commitment. Um, and basketball has been my life since I've been literally a little girl. Sports have been my life, which is completely fine. And it got me education. It got me experience of a lifetime, but it's not who I am. It's not who defines me. Um, and I understood that when I got my injuries, that that's not what, what I wanted to define me, that I liked other things. I like social media. I like branding. I like all this other stuff. So I wanted to really take the time while I'm young to ground myself, like I said, um, to set myself up in the future because you can only play sports for so long. You know, like I want to own my own businesses more than just this clothing company. Like I want to be able to grow and expand. So why not use it while I'm young and I have all this knowledge and I have all this energy and I want to put it into the world. So yeah, I created my brand. It drops 1017 um, on my 22nd birthday. So this Saturday it will drop and it will be online on my website. So super excited about that and what it has is going to do in the future for me in my life. So I, I, I tell young people this all the time. If there's any information that you want to find, there's one place that you can go and it's called Google and you figure out how do you do this? How yeah. do you trademark? How you do all that? But what was your process? Did you have to try to figure out how to do this? How are you going to get the stuff from? How am I going to get it printed or yeah. you know, the, the different things? So tell me about those steps because I'm so, I, I you know, I've done that. I've owned, you know, a couple three, four businesses now. And I had to go learn myself. And I started when I was younger um, and now I'm getting much older, but what was your process, especially for young people out there that may want to try to do something on their own? Like I said, I, I, like you, I Googled, I YouTube, I watch YouTube all the time. I watch vlogs. I'm just into vlogs like that, but I also watch informational, um, informative stuff, uh, to learn about what, what works, what doesn't work and seeing other people and what they did and what doesn't um, work. My family members, I've had a couple people who have had their own businesses, so they've been able to send some stuff to me and help. But honestly, besides like my mom and my, you know, close family, I've had to look up a lot of the stuff on my own, like you need a business license, you need a license, whatever city you're selling it out of, you know, you need a state license, you need, you don't have to have a trademark, but it's just smart to have a trademark to protect yourself legally. So I did all that in the forefront. And it was a lot, honestly, and it's in a completely different lane than I'm in and what I'm used to, because I'm kind of used to people like telling me my schedule and what I need to do. But now that I'm working for myself, it's like I create my own, my own schedule, I create my own destiny. So I had to go out there and I did a lot of research all the um, manufacturers all the printing companies that I went through like I did it on my own um, with my with the help of my family obviously but there's no 
step by step, if even if it is, it's, it's not going to really help. You need to be able to have hands on work unless you want to just pay somebody to do it for yourself. But it's really just about searching it. Like I said, using, like you said, using Google as an engine, because it has all the answers. It's just about taking the time to um, re up on everything and, and set it up for yourself. Wow, I love that. Uh, wish you nothing but success with the brand. Obviously, it's going to be successful behind it, and you put so much energy and effort, and you've got a great story to tell uh, for just just people in in, in general. And I'm definitely going to myself. Um, Thank you. Last couple of things. Tell me about the women's game. Uh, so much uh, energy is put towards men's basketball in the NBA and NCAA, and where you get, you know a ton of fan house and they do the similar things on the men's side, but, and young people do what can continue to further women's basketball because women's, and you're a big proponent of that. What do you? Um, I mean, I feel like it's just support. Honestly, um, a lot of people have been doing a really good job supporting the game, especially right now um, during the whole wobble thing. I saw the women's game getting a lot more support than I feel like they ever have. Um, I feel like, having like NBA players and other people shining light on the fact that our women's game is so much so interesting and doesn't get the platform that it deserves. Um, and I feel like that change will also help younger girls strive to have those type of dreams, you know, like for me, for example, I had a couple examples of, you know, successful women in sports, but I feel like it kind of hindered my dreams or, or lessened my dreams. And I'm like, dang, like, why do I want to work this hard to, uh, you know, do the same thing that men do, but not get the same treatment and, and payment back? You know, it kind of shuts down girls' dreams and women's dreams. So trying to break that box and, and, and break the silence on this injustice is the first step. And a lot of people in the game have been doing a great job um, shining light on this issue. Um, but continuing to do it, just continue to support the women's game, continuing to fight for what's right. Um, the women in the WNBA work as hard as the men in the NBA do. So giving them the equal pay that they deserve is really important. I have teammates now, people that I know in the league. So I feel like they deserve it because they work hard. Um, but yeah, just just focusing on the issues, supporting the game, watching the games and um, posting this and that and just bringing awareness to this issue is the first step to change. And when you were young, did you watch women's basketball games? Um, uh, for being honest, no, I didn't. Um, I watched some here and there, but not not a lot. Um, I didn't really start watching like NCAA basketball until my sister started playing like NCAA and like WNBA games until my sister started playing. Um, she was like my role model. Like I said, she was the person I kind of lived through and, and got my dreams of wanting to be a basketball player through, um, but not through the WNBA because there wasn't a lot of awareness about it. There wasn't a lot of, you know, televised games to be able to have that type of exposure to go to the next level. For sure. Uh, who are the top five players you played against? Sabrina, Di I mean, shoot, Sabrina, Diana, Sue, <laughs> uh, who else? I'm putting my sister in there. Um, and then I'm going to put, um, who's my last one? Who else do I play against? Um, I'm going to put Satu. Satu's in there. Yeah. That's Sue, awesome. Diana, Christina, Satu, and Mariah. Those are my top. Five. That's a good squad, tough squad to go against right there. Um, and what does legacy mean to you? You know, as you are a young person in this world, still figuring out all the things that, you know, you want to accomplish. And if you look, you know, 50, 50, 60 years down the road, what would legacy mean to you? Um, just leaving an impact. Um, I know that like when I go back to SC, when I went back to SC and I played there, you know, people recognize me. They remembered me as being a USC player. Um, they also, when I go back to Oregon, I know those Eugene fans will always remember me and me being a part of that group. Um, so that's legacy, just my name always being remembered. You know, I played basketball, but now I'm trying to take this world of entrepreneurship. Um, so like I said, just remember my name, um, trying to push positive messages to people. Um, giving back to the community when I make some money and I start to actually um, get on my feet. I want to obviously give back to the community, um, maybe create a nonprofit for girls to be able to, you know, get basketball shoes when they can't afford it here in my local community and in the Bay Area. 
Um, so just a lot, just giving back to the community, helping people. And like I said, it takes a village to create what I was able to create and, and experience in college. And people helped my family. You know, it wasn't always easy for my family to get us to tournaments, but it took people to help. So just being able to help in any way, doing what I'm doing right now, talking to you through my experiences and just helping people in any way possible. Um, that's kind of what my brand's trying to do now, just giving people a platform to speak about their experiences and their stories. Uh, very much. And, you know, with all the racial injustice that's kind of gone on, specifically spotlighted over the last seven, eight months, I think that young Black women have kind of been left out of a lot of those conversations. And mm -hmm. what would you tell the people out there as far as like what you had to go through and overcome as a young Black black woman that has success for well, outside of not knowing you might look at you a little bit different what are some of the things that you've had to overcome one and number two um you know should black women be more included in this conversation that has kind of been gone on uh with you know police brutality and and injustices and all of that yeah um i feel like the black woman is one of the most underappreciated and unprotected out here in society. Um, a lot of light is shine on our African-American men, which is great because there's an issue there too, but a lot of times we're forgotten. Um, I've been blessed to be in like organized sports. So I've always been around a family atmosphere. I've always had friends and family to support me and be there for me. I've never really been in a negative situation, but I have dealt with you know racial things people make comments and stuff like that and they're trying to lessen you as a person because of your skin color because you're a woman um so for african-american girls you know there's nothing wrong with being african-american first of all it's a beautiful thing you know our culture everything you know embrace it it's, it's beautiful you know black is beautiful um but always keep your chin up you know never put your head down never let your tiara fall that's what they want you to do so continue to push, you know, if I was in USC classes and people look at me crazy because I'm African American and I'm a female, I, you know, I would speak up. I'm not going to shut up because people want me to be less and think less of myself. That's what they want. So continue to move forward, continue to have your head held high because, you know, you deserve that. Um, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm going to have to continue to do. I feel like I haven't really, really experienced what a lot of people in America experience. Yeah. Um, because I've been sheltered, I've had organized sport and I've had family to lean on. But now that I'm becoming an adult and I have to kind of do things on my own, I'm starting to experience what it's like <laughs> to be an African-American woman in America. Um, but it's something to be ashamed of. And all you can do really is control you and control the people that are around you and people you love. So always try to just surround yourself with support. And um, at the end of the day, no one can tear that down. So yeah and and getting your education people can't ever question education if someone tries to question me i'm about to be like i got two degrees <laughs> don't try you know i have two degrees you can't you can't try to what do you have what do you have that you you know what do you, what do you have compared to what i have and what i've accomplished so just having that confidence if you don't have confidence people people can see that and they can sense that and they can try to tear you down and use it against you but if you have that confidence you'd be you know sit up straight and don't let people talk down to you it's like then they're gonna shut up. They're not gonna keep pushing you if you're gonna, they're gonna keep poking the line if you're like, hey, like you can't try it, you know what I mean? So just always keeping your head held high, speaking off truth and speaking out of your education. So get your education, it's really important. Um, and like I said, always stand up for yourself. I mean, I, I just got to give you a clap for that. I mean, that was amazing. Um, just that's, that's for all women too. That's, that's directed towards African-American just because, you know, African-American women and what we're going through right now. But for women in period, in, in general, women are, you know, there's not, you, there's not equality for women also. So women doing what they have to do and, and just breaking these barrier, barriers, breaking these stereotypes that have, have been placed against us because we're women. Women are great too. They can do the same thing that men can do. So continue to push, continue to just do what you do to get get to the top and break these barriers. Yeah. For, for sure. I'm, I'm on top of the soapbox with you with that. You know, women are incredible <laughs> and they need to be highlighted. All, yes. all races. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, all races. Your points are, are, are really well taken. I hope people really understand that, you know, the education and just speaking out for yourselves and, uh, and all of the things that people don't want you to do, you need to do. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to yeah, do it. Do it. Sure. No, we're not living in, you know, the past. We have these stereotypes against us, but we can vote now. You know, we can get our education. There's people couldn't do that before. 
people couldn't get their education. We didn't have the right to vote. Now we do. So go vote, you know, go get your education, do what we couldn't do before so we can prove these men wrong. Oh, not men, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, before, we, before we get out of here, one, if you had one guest to come on the podcast, uh, who do you think I should have on? And if you say that, make the connection. Um, you can't cool. have your, you can't have your sister because she's coming on. Uh, oh, she's already coming on. Okay, yeah. I think you should get Satu. You should get Satu because um, Satu's dope. Um, she stands for so much more than herself. She stands for equality, for unity. She she speaks up on social injustices. She uses her platform for the best. She's such a great role model. Um, she has a lot of like little siblings, little brothers that look up to her. She's a woman and she, you know, one picture that sticks to me is she had her photo um, with Nike, a, a ad in Germany. And it was her two little brothers looking up at her ad on a billboard. And I'm like, wow, that's powerful. You know, these two young black men are looking up to their African-American sister um, and just her impact. She has such a crazy impact. And Satu, Satu, Satu. She, she's amazing. She's a great friend, great sister. So if you had a chance to interview anybody, talk to her because her education, her wit, her just her intellect is just to another level. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in charge of setting that up. And uh, last thing, right. where, where can everybody, where can everybody follow you? You already have like over a hundred thousand followers everywhere, but you know you need. Oh more. no, not yet. I mean, combined, yeah. But uh, Instagram is Mignon Moore, so just M I N Y O N um, M O O R E. My brand clothing company is Top Two Not Two, so it's Top Two Not Two Apparel um, on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, my website www.top2not2apparel.com. Um, but yeah, you can follow me on TikTok too at Mignon Moore if you want. <laughs> my TikTok. <laughs> okay. Well, good deal. We'll put all that in the show notes. Uh, but thank you so much. You're a class act. Uh, a great, great thank show. You. I really, uh, really enjoyed, you know, a, a young person like you just sharing so much knowledge to people. You're, you're, you're much within your years, young lady. So thank you for joining. Thank me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.